In the same 1919, when the Ottoman Empire is collapsing and it is losing all its non-Turkish possessions, all the Arab parts of the Ottoman Empire are falling away, the Greek army now invades the Turkish mainland, Anatolia. And the Turkish people now have a tremendous fright in their hearts because the Greeks hate them with a PhD in hatred. <laughs> so Britain now has to create a Turkish general who would appear to the Turkish people as a savior who has come down from the heavens with his hands resting on the wings of angels to save the Turkish people. And so at a place called Gallipoli, a man named Mustafa Kemal inflicts a defeat on the ruling state in the world, Britain, and immediately climbs the ladder to become the hero of all heroes in Turkish history. Very convenient, isn't it? Mustafa Kemal now takes over. He is in fact de facto, de facto ruler over the Ottoman Empire. And the Khalifa is just a piece of furniture. In 1920, I think, or 21, there was a big treaty, uh, negotiations in Versailles. And from this emerge now the Turkish Republic, which replaces the Ottoman Islamic State. But Mustafa Kemal said, the Turkish people love their Khalifa. So if Europe could have a Pope, why can't we have a Pope too? This was simplistic thinking on the part of Mustafa Kemal. If the Europeans could have a Pope, well, so too can we. So the new Turkish government of Mustafa Kemal decided to take the Khilafa and remove from it all political authority and make the Khalifa the equivalent of the Pope. This was 1922. And things were going fine for him. Turkish people were happy. Khilafa is still there. And the leadership of the revolution in Turkey were very happy because we have a secular state now, a model after the European state. But in 1924, on the 3rd of March, suddenly Britain demanded, of course, this is secret, they wouldn't reveal it. Britain demanded of, Ottoman, of, of Mustafa Kemal that he must abolish the Khilafah. The, the demand came from Britain. And on the 3rd of March 1924, the Turkish Republic abolished the Khilafah. The question we have to ask is, why did they do it when there was no need to do it? Nothing. It, it represented no threat whatsoever to the secular Turkish Republic. The answer for the abolition of the Khilafah on the 3rd of March 1924 is located in a place called India. But even the Indian scholars of Islam are not aware of it. <laughs> even they are not aware of it. When the attack on the Khilafah was taking place in the 1916, 17, 18 period, then Indian ulama, at that time the Indian Muslim community was one of the most influential Muslim communities in the world. And the Indian Muslim community was led by leaders who knew Islam and lived Islam. Hmm? Men like Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar, Maulana Shaukat Ali, Maulana Sayyid Suleiman Nadwi, Mufti Kifayatullah, men who knew Islam and lived Islam. And they wanted to get rid of British imperial rule in, Britain, in, in India. So that when they got rid of the British, they could restore Islamic rule over Muslims. That's all they wanted. Get rid of the British and restore Islamic rule over Muslims. 
and they realized that they could mobilize the Muslim masses of India over this issue of the Khilafah because everybody loved the Khilafah. And so they established a movement which they call the Khilafat movement, Haratul Khilafah, Harakatul Khilafah, the Khilafat movement. When they established the Khilafat movement and it began to mobilize the Muslim masses, the body which was sleeping is now waking up for revolutionary struggle to preserve the Khilafah in Istanbul. The leader of the Hindus realized, but wait a minute, the Muslims want the same thing that we want. We also want the Hindus, we want to get rid of the British. And we want to restore Hindu rule over the Hindus. So there's a conversion of interest here. So Gandhi, who later became known as Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi approached the leadership of the Khilafat movement and he said to them, listen, the same thing you want, the same thing I want. So why don't we join forces? Will you allow me to join the Khilafat movement? And guess what the leadership of the Indian Muslims did? It was revolutionary theory on their part. And we praise them tonight. They admitted, they accepted the offer of Gandhi and they formed an alliance. And so the Khilafat movement in India now became a Hindu-Muslim alliance for the purpose of getting rid of British rule. And then that would replace, that with which would replace British rule would be Islamic rule over Muslims and Hindu rule over Hindus. This constituted the most dangerous of all threats that Western civilization have ex ever experienced in its entire period of colonization of mankind, this Khilafat movement. Because the Western objective was to demolish every existing state structure in the world and replace it with the secular state. So that the, eventually the secular state could be brought under the umbrella of a League of Nations and eventually a United Nations, and this would be political globalization at work. Hmm? If the Khilafat movement were to succeed, then one of the most important communities in the world, the Indian Muslims, will escape. Because when the British withdrew, Muslims will be ruled by Islam, and Hindus will be ruled by Hinduism. Between 1920 and 1924, the Khilafat movement was building up steam at an alarming rate. And by 1924, the British had calculated, we have to get rid of this Khilafat movement. And the only way we can think of now is to abolish the Khilafat. And so they put the pressure on Mustafa Kemal. As soon as the Khilafat was abolished, the Khilafat movement in India began to lose steam. In the same year that it was abolished in 1924, in that same year, the secularly minded British, uh, in, Indian, in Indian language they call it Chamcha, <laughs> the stooges of the British in India, the brown-skinned Englishmen parading as Muslims, hmm? of whom the prince of them all was the grandfather of the present Aga Khan, Karim Aga Khan's grandfather. They now restore an organization called the All India Muslim League. Huh? The All India Muslim League is led by men who don't know Islam and don't live Islam. And these are the people who now wage a struggle for the liberation of the Muslims from British rule to be replaced, not with rule of Islam, oh no, but rather by the rule of the secular Republic of Pakistan, 
and the Secular Republic of India, so that Pakistan and India could be embraced within the community of secular nation states. But of course you had to put a little red herring to fool, to fool the people. So you have to make it appear as though Pakistan is going to emerge as an Islamic state, but that's just dust in their eyes, to fool those who see with only one eye. And so in 1924, on the 3rd of March, the Caliphate was abolished. When the Caliphate was abolished, Sharif al Hussein realized that he was in grave danger now. So long as there was a Khalifa in Istanbul, the British needed him. <laughs> but now that the Caliphate was destroyed, abolished, Sharif al Hussein now realizes the plan. He says, Oh my gosh, they must send Abdulaziz ibn Saud to cut my throat now. In exactly the same way that Abdullah of Jordan is now realizing, as soon as Bush attacks Iraq, that is the end of me. Hmm? So uh, Sharif al Hussein decides four days later, on the 7th of March 1924, to claim the Khilafah for himself. But when you're a client state of Britain, you can't do that. You have to first apply to the British government for permission <laughs> to become the Khalifa. Hmm? He didn't do that. As soon as Sharif al Hussein claimed the Khilafat for himself on the 7th of March 1924, you're going to get all of this information in that book which is outside the Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. As soon as he did that, Britain gave the green light to Abdul Aziz. Attack. Within six months, the Saudi uh, uh, the, uh, 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 army of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud conquered Mecca. And Abdul Aziz uh, and Sharif Hussein packed his suitcase and off he went. British took him away. This one the Americans will take out of Jordan. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud is now in control of Mecca and eventually Medina. It's a Saudi Wahhabi alliance. Does he claim the Khilafah for himself now? No. What he does is, as soon as he enters Mecca, in 1924, October, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud makes a proclamation and they're going to hate me for revealing this to you. Because nobody remembers it now. The proclamation which he makes is that this land belongs to the entire Ummah. Huh? This land belongs to the entire Ummah. I wonder how a Pakistani or a Bengali Muslim will feel when he hears that and he's been rounded up like dogs, stray dogs and put on trucks because he's overstayed his visa while white-skinned Americans and British are treated like princes in the Holy Land. How will a Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi feel? This land belongs to the entire Ummah. And it is for the Ummah, not for Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, for the Ummah to establish the government which will rule over this land. That is his proclamation in 1924. But in cricket it's called playing for time. He did this because in April of 1924, Al-Azhar University had responded to the Turkish abolition of the Khilafah. What did they do? Al-Azhar University declared that this was bid'ah and haram to abolish the Khilafah. Hmm? And therefore we must respond to it. And the response of Al-Azhar is that we must have a mu'tamar, a conference, which would meet and which would appoint a new Khalifa. As soon as Al-Azhar issued this proclamation, you could see how Britain was trembling. The British government can't digest their food now. They've got to plan some counter strategy to the initiative of Al-Azhar University. The counter strategy is that Egypt is itself not a free country. It may appear free, but Britain really has control over Egypt. 
So Britain puts pressure on King Fuad, the father of King Farouk. You're too old to hear about, you're too young to know about this. And King Fuad, uh, Fuad is now putting pressure on Al Azhar to hold back on this conference. Hmm? So for two years the conference can't take place. Two years because of British pressure. The conference finally takes place in June, July of 1926. But Britain uses another counter strategy. She gets Abdulaziz ibn Saud in Makkah to also convene a conference of the world of Islam in Makkah at the time of the Hajj, which is May of 1926. And then Britain and Russia and France and China and all the major powers in Europe all get to work. Massive intervention in the affairs of the world of Islam to ensure that the Cairo conference does not succeed in winning a representative gathering and that the Mecca conference gets all the Muslims attending it and they succeeded. The Cairo conference organized by Al-Azhar University becomes an essentially Arab conference because non-Arabs are hardly present. The conference met the conference decided that the Khilafa was an essential part of the deen, that it was bid'ah and haram to abolish it, that the Khilafa must be restored, but we don't know how to do it. So let's go back home and come back after one year. That was the decision. We don't know how to do it. But in Makkah, you had the most successful representation of the entire world of Islam because Britain really went to work on it. This conference is now convened but strangely for the Wahhabi movement. Strangely for the Wahhabi movement which is a religious movement which declares that it is bringing back the original Islam and removing all the extraneous things which had been added and cutting out all the shirk. So this is the real Islam. Well then how come you don't even have the subject of the Khilafah in your agenda for your conference? We asked the Wahhabi movement, give us an answer. There is no answer. The answer is that the Wahhabi Saudi Alliance is now perpetrating a gigantic, a massive betrayal of Islam in abandoning the Khilafah. And so the conference takes place. But the subject of the Khilafah is not even on the agenda of the conference. Instead, Abdulaziz ibn Saud approaches the conference twice himself in person and he asks the conference to recognize him as Al-Malik. <laughs> that his rule should be recognized over the Hijaz. When the conference had heard His Majesty the King on both occasions and the conference is now sitting down to discuss the matter Shall we recognize Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz? The leader of the Indian Muslim delegation jumped up to speak first. He spoke first. His name was Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar. He got up and he told the king, get lost. We'll never do that. As soon as the leadership of the Indian Muslim delegation had established its position of rejecting the claim of the Saudi Wahhabi leadership for sovereignty and control over the Hijaz, the rest of the delegates couldn't say, mm. that was the power of a man who knew Islam and lived Islam. And so the conference ended without giving to the Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz recognition. They decided that they'll meet every year, but that was the last time they ever met. 
This then was the response of the world of Islam to the abolition of the Khilafah. In 1930, I think, or 31, Hajj Amin al Hussein in Jerusalem felt that the ominous advance of the Jews in the Holy Land required a response from the world of Islam. So he sought to reconvene the conference in Jerusalem. But it, it was a new conference. It gave it a new name in 1930 or 31. They call it the Al Aqsa Conference or the Mu'tamar al Am. And this conference also met in 1930-31, but you meeting to establish Darul Islam in a territory which is under British rule. Nothing could be more foolish than that. How can you restore Darul Islam when you're meeting in a territory which is under British rule? And you, get a, you have to get permission from the British government to hold your conference. So the conference ended without being able to do anything about it. Since then to this day, there has been no effort no significant effort on the part of the world of Islam to restore the Khilafah. Why? Simple. Because you cannot restore the Khilafah unless, unless and until you can liberate the Hijaz, Makkar and Medina. You can't do that. When the Hijaz, the security of the Hijaz is underwritten by Uncle Sam, 